on to cleft palate and communicative disorders. Previously we discussed oral communication. Uh, we've reviewed cognition and language and articulation and now we're going to move down into resonation. Our objectives for this lecture are to discuss resonance, introduce the resonance anatomy, and then discuss cleft palate. Uh, we'll go into the causes and the presentations of cleft palate as well as the treatment. In the second lecture, we will talk about how the SLP really becomes involved um, after surgery, as well as some of the different areas that can be impacted um, by surgeries or due to um, other factors. This is briefly based on chapter 9 in your textbook, but you're not required to read the textbook in this lecture. So starting from the bottom, we have respiration, right? That's just our breathing in and out. And then we have phonation, which is just the production of the sound, which is our voice. And what we're going to talk about today is the resonation, how that sound goes from the vocal folds and bounces around all of the open cavities, and how that sound is directed from one cavity to another. Uh, we already covered speech and we already covered language. So what is resonance? Resonance is um, essentially the modification of the voice as it passes through the laryngeal, the pharyngeal, the oral, and the nasal cavities. So resonation is very just simply um, a reaction to the sound produced somewhere else. So as that sound bounces around those cavities, the tissues vibrate and modify how that sound uh, is and how it's perceived. So in order to have good resonance, we have to have a balance of our oral and nasal resonance and that airflow so that we can correctly articulate our sounds um, as well as uh, have good production of our voice and our voice quality. So looking at our uh, diagram over here on the right, you can see that we've talked about articulation in the oral cavity and we're moving further back now into the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, uh, the pharynx, the larynx, and just stopping there. Everything above the larynx is really resonance, below the larynx and within the larynx is phonation, um, and then we have the trachea and the lungs for res respiration. I'm going to dive into uh, resonating anatomy, um, but first I want to just orient you overall. So when we're looking at this picture here on the right, this column right here is the trachea. That's where air flows in and out. This little circle here is the vocal cords. Right above that in this light peak section we have the larynx, right, and the larynx extends right here. On this side you have this open column, this is the pharynx, okay, and then where it closes off about in this area is where the esophagus starts. So the pharynx is again just this very open structure. Um, and then right here this little flap is the epiglottis, it's a piece of tissue that's the very top of the larynx. This you'll see is the tongue, right? So this area right here is the oral cavity. The oral cavity is just what it is, it's a cavity, it's a space. And it houses the tongue, it houses the teeth. Um, back here at the top we have the velum. This portion right here is the palate. And then this area here is the nasal cavity. So what we're going to focus on for resonation is, of course, everything above the vocal folds. So the vocal folds produce voice. The larynx um, resonates the sound as it comes off of the vocal cords. That sound travels up the pharynx and then goes either to the mouth or the nose. What determines if the sound or the air goes through the mouth or the nose is what's known as the velopharyngeal port. So the velopharyngeal port is just the opening here between the pharynx, the back of the pharynx and the sides of the pharynx, um, and then the back of the velum, so this nasal portion of the velum. So when we're at rest, the velum is just low and almost touching the tongue or should be touching the tongue. When we go to speak, it coordinates as that sound comes out to tell the sound whether it needs to go either through the nose or through the mouth. And remember, we only have three nasal sounds, our M, our N, and our NG sound. And so those sounds will come through the nose. And then when we swallow, it also closes off to keep anything from coming through our nose when we swallow. So you'll see this kind of bumpy area here on the back. These are the adenoids. Um, and Many of you might have had your adenoids removed. That's usually where they sit. And the back of the pharynx and the sides of the pharynx squeeze together um, as the velum goes up and back. 
What we also have is something called Passivance Ridge. Not everyone has Passivance Ridge uh, visible uh, when they're talking, but it's essentially just a little muscle on the back of the throat that comes out and can help with closing this velopharyngeal port. So it's usually about in this area just below the adenoids. It's not present on this picture, um, but it is a part of our anatomy. It's just more present in some people than in others. Now watch those muscles in action. So let me get my pointer. We have down here the uh, larynx where the vocal folds are. They come together and kind of blur. That's when the voice is being produced. That sound bounces around through the larynx into the pharynx, right? And then it from here is directed either into the mouth or through the nasal cavity. What determines that is again the velopharyngeal port. So is, if the velopharyngeal port is open, you see it open here, just very briefly, um, then the sound is directed through the nose. If the velopharyngeal port is closed, then that sound is directed through the mouth. So how is this all done? Um, essentially it's through different velar muscles. So the most important velar muscle for speech is the levator veli palatini. You can remember levator as an elevator, right? And it's something that goes up and down. So this muscle is responsible for bringing the velum up and back, and it's controlled by cranial nerve 10, right? That's our vagus nerve. It's a very important nerve. You'll hear about it over and over again. So when we're looking at this picture over here, we can see the levator veli palatini creates a sling across the back, right? Um, and then we have the tensor veli palatini that's just here in the front. That's important for opening the eustachian tubes. And the eustachian tubes are what uh, help drain fluid from the back of the eardrum and keep the fluid balanced in the ear. So that's the one muscle of the velum that is controlled by cranial nerve 5 and it's most important for hearing. Um, everything else is really important for that tight velopharyngeal closure. So we have the um, musculus uvulae, so that is the muscle here in the back. It's not the uvula itself. The uvula is essentially just a piece of tissue. Um, but the musculus uvulae is a band of tissue here in the back. Then we have the palatoglossus muscle, which creates this underside um, of the sling, and it helps pull the velum down. The palatopharyngus is also responsible for pulling the velum down, and it's this lower portion here on the sides. So if you think about muscles, the ones that help raise the velum up are in that U-shaped. The ones that help bring the velum down are in that U uh, upside down U-shaped. And if you look at the names, that can help you as well. So pallidopharyngus, the palate, pallido is the palate, the pharyngus is the pharynx. So this muscle attaches to the palate and the pha pharynx. Then you have the pallidoglossus, and that attaches to the palate and the tongue. So this is just another way to look at that. If we're looking at the mouth kind of deconstructed um, from the back, you can see here, um, we'll start with A, the levator veli palatini, and this is again that sling-like structure. And then we have the musculus uvulae. This is again that little portion right here that extends into the uvula. And then we have uh, over on this side the tensor veli palatini, the pallidopharyngus, which is attaching from the palate up here in the top, down to the pharynx, you can see these bands of tissues attaching down at the back. And then we have the palatoglossus where it's attaching up here at the top to the palate and then here on the side to the tongue. And then what's most important from the pharyngeal muscle side is the superior pharyngeal constrictors. So these are the bands of tissue up here at the very top of the pharynx. Remember this is the pharynx that extends down uh, to the top of the food pipe. This right here is the bone of the maxilla, um, where the palate kind of sits underneath. Um, but this area right here is the superior constrictors. So if you look at these bands of tissue, they kind of form a circle here in the back, and that's how the muscles move. They squeeze together as the muscle of the uvula moves back to seal this portion um, to keep air or food going into the nose. So we've talked about how we have the velum and the pharynx coming together um, to seal a hole, right? So when we're looking at this picture here on the left, we have how the muscles can come together. So if we're looking at anterior, that's what's the velum, 
The posterior is the pharynx, okay? So this is the velum, that levator veli palatini, and back here in the back is that uh, superior constrictors. We also have lateral or side constrictors of the pharynx, so that's what you're seeing um, over here on each side that kind of completes the circle. So the most typical closure pattern is the velum moving back to touch the back of the pharynx or the posterior pharyngeal wall. Another closure pattern is where the sides of the pharynx just come towards the middle and the goal is always to get things to the middle to seal everything off. Um, there's also a pattern where you have the sides of the pharynx come together as well as the velum coming together and then you have another where all four sides come together. Between the four of them, A and D are probably the more common. Um, B and C are uh, kind of different closure patterns, they're not as frequent. So when we're using a scope, we're looking at using a camera to look through the nose and look at this portion of the very top of the velopharyngeal port, um, and it should create a sphincter. So you can see here on the bottom, I know this is uh, kind of difficult to visualize because it's black and white, but I want you to see here, this is the velum. This here on the side is the lateral pharyngeal wall, over on this side is also the lateral pharyngeal wall, and then you have the flush posterior pharyngeal wall in the back. So as those muscles squeeze together, that's what it's going to look like over here. It creates that sphincter, and you see that everything is nice and sealed. There's no more gap or opening in the middle. And that's because the velum, the lateral, and the posterior pharyngeal walls have really squeezed together to close that hole off, and that keeps the sound coming through the nose. All right, so that's our normal, typical velopharyngeal movement and pattern what muscles are involved. There's a uh, video on Moodle that I want you to watch. Uh, it's module 1.4. And I want you to only watch right now from the beginning to about five minutes and 33 seconds. And then I want you to pause that video and you'll finish watching the rest of the video after the end of this lecture. Um, but it's going to give you some more visuals that I can't quite give you in this lecture um, so that you can understand how those muscles work. So moving into cleft palate, we have to really define what cleft palate is. So cleft is just um, a fissure or a split or an opening. And it's an opening that can pass through one or more structures. Um, so when we talk about cleft in speech, we're really focusing on a cleft palate or a cleft lip. So a cleft can happen in multiple places. What we're most concerned about is cleft palates and lips. So cleft palates is just an opening that runs through the soft palate or the bony portion of the roof of the mouth, so the hard palate. Uh, cleft lip is just an opening running through the top lip. Cleft lips and palates are classified as craniofacial anomalies. And that just means that there's just something a little bit different about the way that the face or the cranium was formed. So a cleft appears when there's a failure in the premaxilla, so the front of the maxilla, to fuse with the uh, maxillary bone, or there's a failure of a fusion between the two palatine uh, structures of the bone in the roof of the mouth. So muscle follows bone, so if the bones don't fuse together, then it causes a gap in the muscles as well, and it leaves a wide opening uh, in the roof of the mouth or the lip. Ultimately, it can result in velopharyngeal dysfunction, which we'll talk about what that is, but if you look at those words, it should kind of make sense to you. Um, essentially, we have velopharyngeal is the velum in the pharynx, right? That velopharyngeal port dysfunction just doesn't work right. Um, so it can result in compensatory speech errors um, or resonance errors. So there are different causes of cleft. Um, there are genetic factors where we have higher rates in Asian and American Indians, but it's actually a lower uh, incidence of cleft in African-derived populations. Uh, cleft palate is more frequent in males than fe or females than males, and cleft lip is more frequent in males than females. Um, there is a familial tendency, so if you have a history of cleft palate in your family, you're most, more likely than someone who doesn't have that history to have a child with cleft lip or cleft palate. So you can look over here on the right, um, we have this picture of this cute little girl, and she has a cleft lip and a cleft palate. Um, this little boy down here has only a cleft lip. So environmental factors can also influence the uh, incidence of a cleft lip or a cleft palate, so if a mother smokes or drinks during pregnancy, then you're at more risk for a cleft lip or palate. Uh, if there's a 
B6 vitamin deficiency or if they're exposed to radiation. There's other factors that play into it as well, um, but really those are the more primary ones. Um, another thing to consider is that it's multifactorial, and that's a genetic term that essentially means that by chance you just happen to have a kid with a cleft palate. It doesn't mean that the mother did something wrong uh, during pregnancy. She may have not smoked. She may have not uh, had anything to drink. She may have had perfect vitamins. There may be no family history of cleft palate. It just happened by chance. One of the genes just said, oh, I don't want to do my job. I don't want to show up today. And so the uh, cleft doesn't fuse. Or the cleft uh, occurs because the palate doesn't fuse. Okay, so we've talked about um, the palate according to um, articulation. In cleft palate, they describe the palate a little bit differently. So in articulation, we divide it into the alveolar ridge, the hard palate, and the soft palate. In cleft palate, we divide it into the primary palate and the secondary palate. So the primary palate is from the very front, just in front of the teeth portion of the palate, all the way back to just behind the alveolar ridge. So it's really from those first four teeth right here in the front of the mouth. Everything behind that is the secondary palate all the way down to the soft palate. So when we're looking at this picture here, we have different variations of cleft lip and cleft palate. So right here we have just a notch in the vermilion border. So if you look at this picture over here, the vermilion, vermilion border is just the outside of the lip. So we have this cleft here on this baby where it's just on the lip, right? So that is a true cleft lip. It's only on one side, so that's called a unilateral cleft lip. When we're looking at this baby here, you can see that that cleft extends beyond the vermilion border and actually into the nair. Um, and the mouth isn't open, but you can look at this picture here. So the cleft is here in the front and extends all the way back. So that's a complete unilateral cleft lip and palate. That means that the cleft is here at the front of the lip and then it extends the uh, entire length of the palate. Then we have a bilateral cleft lip and palate. So you can look here. We have a cleft, just a whole opening right here. When you look into a baby's mouth with a cleft lip and palate that's bilateral, sometimes they'll actually have a little band of tissue right here, and that's where the uh, inside of the nares are separated. Um, and then you have just a, a pure cleft palate. So cleft palates can occur in different places. We have a um, primary cleft palate that can occur just in the front. You can have a secondary cleft palate that's just in the back, so it's essentially just a hole in the roof of the mouth. This is a complete cleft palate, meaning that it uh, extends to the front of the palate all the way to the back of the palate. So that's what this looks like in a real uh, infant. We have a cleft lip here, and you can see that the gums are intact just behind or just above my laser pointer. Um, so that's just a true cleft lip, um, and it's incomplete because it doesn't extend into the gum line. Right here we have a unilateral cleft lip of the um, primary palate, um, cleft, uh, I'm sorry, a cleft of the lip and the primary palate. And it's unilateral because it's only affecting the one side. You can see that this nose is, uh, nair is completely intact and then this lip here is completely intact. And when you're looking at these infants, you can actually see how the lips have formed. So right here we have the piece of the lip um, and this is the cupid's bow. And then we have the other piece of the lip. This is a bilateral cleft lip and palate. And you can see this is what I was talking about in the previous picture. So we have the uh, cleft right here in the lip and then that extends all the way back. And you see this little band here is just where the nose um, has the two divisions of the nares. So what that really tells you is that this is really a full structure. Um, everything is there. It's just not meeting where it's supposed to, right? So again, we can look right here. We have the side of the lip. This is a nostril. This is the uh, lip right here that should form the cupid's bow. This is the portion of the lip should, that should attach to the cupid's bow. And then you see the bottom lip. And then on here, we have just an isolated cleft palate. And that's um, of the secondary palate. Okay, so all these ridges here, you can see the alveolar ridge is intact, but that secondary palate is open.
and this is another one of cleft lip and palate. Um, so right here you can see there's no opening in the palate, so this is what's called a submucosal cleft. That means that the muscles or the um, mucosa is intact, but there's actually a cleft um, above, these, uh, muc above the mucosa um, on the nasal side. And so you can look right here in the back, the uvula looks a little bit different. That's called a bifid uvula. And that means that they have a uvula here and they have a uvula here. So there are actually two uvulas. And if you hit them with a tongue depressor, sometimes they'll separate. On this right here, we have um, a secondary uh, palate, palatal cleft. This is another palatal cleft. Um, and then we have a complete palatal cleft right here. The children with cleft palate can uh, present with different problems. Every child is kind of a puzzle that we have to piece together. Um, one thing I want you to keep in mind with cleft palate is that it can be a uh, it can happen in a typically developing kid. So it doesn't have to be a child with a syndrome or a developmental delay or some other type of disorder. It can just be a typical kid with a hole in their mouth. Um, and so as we're going through some of the problems that cleft palate or cleft lip children can present with, just keep in mind that it's a varying degrees and some children might not have any of these problems um, or some children have all of these problems. It really just depends. So when we're looking at children f through the lifespan, we're starting with them in infancy. So if we find out that a child has a cleft lip or palate, they're going to have some type of feeding assessment to see if they can efficiently eat from a bottle or from the breast. And that's because children with cleft lip and palate can have trouble creating seals. So if you think about the mouth, it's essentially just a, a cave. Right? So if you put a nipple of a bottle in there, you have to be able to press the tongue to the roof of the mouth and push the milk out of the bottle. If there's not a, a roof of the mouth, then it doesn't have anything to press against, so you're not going to have as much milk draining from the bottle. From a breast perspective, the breast is extracted uh, a little bit differently from a than it is from a, uh, a bottle, in that you have to have the breast tissue fill the oral cavity, and then you have to create a vacuum seal where that pressure changes from the um, space in the mouth to extract the milk from the breast. And if the child can't create that vacuum seal, then they're not going to be as efficient with breastfeeding. What we actually find with a lot of cleft um, palate babies is that they don't do um, horrible with breastfeeding. Sometimes they actually do pretty well. Um, and if we have to, we can support the mom with breastfeeding um, by adding tubes in so that they extract the milk and they're getting the um, feedback and the child is getting the exposure and experience to breastfeeding um, without having to worry about how much milk is extracted from the breast. If we're working with a child who drinks from a bottle, we might change the bottle nipple um, so that they can more efficiently pull milk from the bottle. As the child gets older, if they still have a cleft lip or palate, or if they uh, have problems after surgery uh, with the velopharyngeal port, then they might have food or liquid coming through the nasal cavity. It's not always uh, uh, something that happens, but it does happen. Uh, many of these children have problems with middle ear disease or hearing loss. In infancy, some of these kids uh, or babies might even have milk coming into the ears, and that's because that tensor vili palatini isn't doing what it needs to do to drain the eustachian tubes. And so all that fluid builds up and they get hearing infections or otitis media. These children might also have dental problems. It might be related to the cleft. It might be related to their syndrome as well. Um, so they might have problems with malic Inclusion. They might have too few teeth or too many teeth, and they might have poor jaw growth. Um, so there's something called retronathia, uh, and that just means that the jaw isn't as large as it needs to be, so it's set back. Some of these kids might have language disorders, so they could have slower acquisition, a smaller or less varied vocabulary, and shorter or simpler sentences. 
Um, and that can be related to a syndrome or a developmental delay. It can also be related to just typical language development. So if you think about a kid who looks a little bit different than their friends, or you think about new parents who has an infant that looks like they have an injury on their face, they could be cautious um, and not interact with them as much. There are multiple studies that show that parents of uh, children with a cleft lip or palate interact with their infants less than their uh, typical infants. Um, and whether that's related to being scared of interacting with them or scared of handling them because sometimes they look like they're broken, um, it can impact their overall language development because they're not getting as much feedback as they need to develop their language. Um, these kids can also have speech disorders. So these are articulation disorders where they could have distorted speech sounds because they're sending too much air or too much sound through their nose. And so they get kind of a <laughs> kind of quality. Um, they might also omit sounds or substitute sounds. So an omission could be an example of not saying any um, K's or G's because they don't have a palate in the back to contact the back of the tongue to the roof of the mouth to make the K or the G sound, and so they might leave it out completely. They might also substitute where instead of a K or a G, they say a T or a D because they have the palate in the front, they can make that contact, and so they might say tat instead of cat. Um, these kids can also have nasal emission, uh, and we'll talk about nasal emission more so in the second lecture. We'll talk about speech disorders in general more in the second lecture. We're going to move now into uh, the treatments for cleft palate. So when we're looking at cleft palate or cleft lip, we're really looking at them from a team perspective. So we have to be able to determine ultimately what the appropriate treatment is for these ch children across the lifespan. So it's not a one and done kind of close the hole and move on. Um, because things can happen after surgery. So uh, here in Baton Rouge, we have the craniofacial and cleft team um, at Our Lady of the Lake. Um, and it's really made up of multiple uh, professions. And we're looking at the child from many different perspectives to see how treatment can influence the child long term. So on a typical cleft palate team, you have a plastic surgeon. That's the person in charge of closing the hole. Uh, a speech-language pathologist who's assessing uh, feeding and speech, a dentist that looks at occlusion um, and teeth development, an orthodontist that looks at jaw development, uh, an otologist, so somebody that measures um, hearing and hearing impairment if these children need um, intervention with uh, hearing aids or cochlear implants, an audiologist, um, who also looks at that with the otologist, a psychologist, a social worker, um, and those can be uh, related to how the family or how the child is coping with having a cleft lip or palate, um, access to medical care, access to medical insurance, um, any kind of support that the child might need uh, in addition to their medical care, they're looking at all of that. Um, a general pediatrician who's looking at the overall health of the child, and then a geneticist consults to talk to the parents about not only their potential for having another child with a cleft lip or palate, but uh, also the child's um, chance of having another child with a cleft lip or palate, and ultimately determining what the cause of that cleft lip or palate is. So when we do those assessments initially, what we're ultimately trying to figure out is what the palate looks like, where the muscles are, and how they need to be brought together to fill that hole. So again, these surgeries are not just putting a band-aid over a hole, they're actually fusing the muscles back together. So think back to the very beginning when we talked about how the muscles need to come together to create a sling that pulls the velum up and back. If we're looking at these different types of surgeries here, then we're looking at how they're pulling those muscles together. So starting down here at the bottom, we have um, the levator vili palatini that was probably more forward facing initially. And then through this surgery, they're pulling the levator vili palatini to the sides to meet here in the middle and create that U shape that it needed to create. 
here in the middle, they're actually pulling the mucosa together. So they open up the uh, hard palate mucosa and then bring it together in the middle to fuse, um, fuse it and put a band-aid over it. Um, so this is what a um, palatoplasty looks like. So over here we have a Z-plasty, and so this is again where we have the um, levator veli palatini muscles facing more forward or front and back from the front of the mouth to the back. And they're going to make an incision across um, the mucosa and the muscles, and then they pull those muscles together to um, close the uh, cleft, and that leaves a Z-shape, so that's why it's called a Z-plasty. And then if you think about um, the gap from a cleft palate and pulling these muscles across, these muscles aren't designed to fill this void because in development in the uterus they really didn't have to fill this void and so as they're doing these surgeries they're stretching these muscles and so they can't be as flexible as they needed to be because it's essentially like pulling a ba uh, rubber band really tightly and then trying to lift it up it's not going to lift as far than a, a rubber band that's kind of relaxed and not pulled. And so we can have issues with how well the velum lifts and closes off that velopharyngeal port. This surgery up at the top is called a uh, posterior pharyngeal flap, um, and they're creating a sphincter. So what they do is make an incision on the back of the posterior pharyngeal wall, just in the mucosa. They don't go into the muscle, so it's kind of just a scrape on the back of the throat and they take that flap, pull it up to cover up the uh, cleft palate. And it creates a little bit of a sling on the back of the throat and it helps close the velopharyngeal port and then when they suture it up, they close it all up, they tuck the uvula in um, and it makes this really nice seal um, on, the, on the back of the mouth. The problem with that is is that you're pulling in muscles that didn't really have a responsibility before other than to squeeze around the back of the throat. And so now that they're stretched up from the back of the throat to the back of the velum um, and creating this sling from the front to the back, they have to figure out their new role so it might not be as efficient as so we're going to move on into the next lecture and talk about the outcomes of these treatments and how speech therapy uh, gets involved. But so far we've talked about what resonance is and how the sound really uh, bounces around in those uh, cavities. We talked about the different types of resonating anatomy and then we talked about cleft palate and the causes and uh, the presentations of uh, cleft palate and the treatment for that. So at this point I want you to finish watching module 1.4 on Moodle and you're welcome to read chapter 9 but again it's not required.